Good morning. Pastor Vance got called on a classes assignment. It was a short announcement, so we didn't even get a chance to promote it in the bulletins. But he will be back with us next Sunday. If you're a guest here, we want to welcome you. After church, if you go right through that door, we have fellowship with uh, coffee and cookies, and we'd just like to get to know you a little better. So, once again, welcome to Faith Reformed Church. Let's pray. Father, as we meet now, may we behold your beauty and encounter your grace. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and praise. As we gather, we remember those who are not with us today. For those who are sick, we ask for healing. And for those away from us, we ask for your blessing to be on them. We invite your beautiful Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Come dwell in each of our hearts. Inspire us as we learn more about your majestic ways. We ask all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We can hardly fathom the kind of love that would sacrifice an only son for unworthy people. And we can hardly fathom that that son was willing to do it. And yet here we are, the recipients, unworthy recipients of that deep, deep love. And we're here today to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the King of Glory, and to proclaim with all the saints and angels, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Will you stand and join us? Worthy is the king. 
king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. It's trying to cripple us with fear. Fear of all the unknown things in the economy, relationships, sicknesses, depression, anxiety. But that's not our story. Our story is not one of fear. As believers, our story is one of faith. We have to have the faith to open our eyes and see that God is always before us. He stands behind us, and he's with us all the time. Oh, no. 
If there are any, you can come up for the children's message. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. I brought something with me today. You know what this is? Do you? What is it? Salt. Salt, you're right. Salt. Hmm. You know what? We don't think very much about salt, but I think if we didn't have it, we would probably really miss it. When I think about salt, and probably you too, you think about when we put it on food, right? Yeah. Um, I like salt on my french fries and potato chips and pretzels. Oh, I don't even think they taste good if they don't have salt. What do you like salt on? Mm. Do you like salt on anything? <laughs> so, did you know that salt can be used for lots and lots of things? We use salt to make our food taste better. And do you know that salt can preserve food and make it last longer without refrigerating it? Salt can melt ice in the winter time on our driveways and sidewalks. And do you know, I googled and there was like 60 ways you can clean with salt. <laughs> That's a lot of things, right? And did you know what? Our bodies need a little bit of salt. We would die if we didn't have salt in our bodies. And Jesus has something to say about salt in his word. If I can get it up here. <laughs> I'm going to just turn this way, okay? In Matthew 5, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So what Jesus is saying there is that we are the salt, that how we live our lives, how we react to people if we're kind to people and helpful and loving, we become like salt that, that makes food last longer, that makes food taste good, that melts that ice and keeps our bodies working. But guess what? See this nifty little container here? It's full of salt and even has holes there so the salt can shake out. But if I never lift it up and shake it, it's no good, is it? I have to lift it up and I have to shake it out for it to be effective, for it to do those things. And that's the same way with you. In order for you to be salt, you have to be aware of the things that you do. You need to be kind and loving and caring. And in that way, people will see something different in you. They will see that there's something so different that they want to know what it is. And what do you think that difference is? Who makes you different? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus makes us different, doesn't he? And that's what we want to do. We want to be different. You know, there's lots of ways. You just have to keep your eye out for ways to be salt and light. So this week, I want each one of you to be a salt shaker that gets tipped over and shaken out, OK? Can you do that? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you were salt to all of us when you walk the earth and that you continue to be as you pour out your love on us. And, and we just are so grateful that we have your example to help lead us. Help us to be 
salt shakers that tip over and shake out our love for you and for other people in all that we do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, amen. Okay, you can go back to your parents. for pulpit supply. I emailed Bob Ross. I said, could you come? Sometimes when you, you send out these emails, it'll go for a couple of months. And then sometimes the consistory gets nervous. They say, well, you, you're in charge of pulpit supply. Who's coming? I'm working on it, we say. Well, I sent this email to Bob each of heard out guys, it seemed like about five minutes, he said, I'd love to come. <laughs> so with that, Bob. Oh my, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I do love to come, honestly. I, I enjoy coming here. I enjoy preaching God's word. And, uh, and I hope I can be an encouragement to you this morning, and I hope God's word blesses us all today. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is each day to look into your word, 
to be instructed by it and challenged and encouraged by it. And I pray that for these next few minutes this morning as we look at your word and the example that Paul set for us in this area of prayer, that, Lord, you'd speak to us, uh, not, not through me or, or anything else, but through your word and your Holy Spirit. Pray this in your name. Amen. Well, it truly is a privilege to be here, and I, and I treat it as such. I treat it as a privilege to study and to preach God's word. This morning, I want to look at, uh, at this topic of prayer, and uh, it struck me again this week. Uh, Tuesday morning, I got a, a text message from one of our elders at church, and he said, Bob, you have uh, a few minutes to take a confidential phone call. And when one of the elders says that, you say yes. So we talked, he called, and he said, uh, this young man, young man, Andrew, had started drinking again. Way back in February, this elder and myself walked alongside Andrew and, and his wife, through a, a long process of detox and medication and Time at the healthcare center, and so I was extremely saddened by the news that he relapsed and and went back to uh, to, to his addiction. And I said, Chris, what what do we what do we do? We've walked him through this process just a few months ago and and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and and he was clean and and for several months and and now uh, is back and and hopefully for uh, you know just a temporary relapse but once an alcoholic always an alcoholic we know that so it just reminded me once again, the importance of prayer and how that sometimes that's, it seems like that's all we can do. And I talked to this young man this week and I said, I, I, I am there for you. If, you. if you need anything, please reach out to me or reach out to your counselor, reach out to someone in the church to, to help you with accountability. But in the end, all I could do is pray. And what a testimony is Paul writes this letter to Timothy, which is Paul's last recorded letter that we have in the Bible shortly before his execution. The first thing he does is pray. That's all he could do. He's in prison. He's had a... a a significant impact of ministry for years, evangelizing and, and training, going on missionary journeys, bringing people alongside, encouraging them, just like Timothy here. He mentored young Timothy. And yet now we see he's towards the end of his life and, and Paul sets the example for us and, and he prays. I want to look at 2 Timothy this morning, the first couple verses uh, up through verse 6. I just want to read that. I just want to pull a few principles out from that today that hopefully encourage us as we walk our daily lives. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life, that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. 
grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that you may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith with which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. What a tremendous example as Paul reflected now on his life and his ministry and, and the people that maybe deserted him and the people that came alongside of him. He sets the example for us and, and he prays. But he prayed not for himself here, he prayed for others. And I think that's the, the three principles I want to share this morning how Paul prayed and how he set the example for us as, as we need to pray. Whether it's for this young man that, that has an addiction that uh, someone once said he, uh, he loves his addiction more than he loves fill in the blank, anything. More than he loves his wife, more than he loves God, more than he loves his job. Paul sets the example for us that we are to pray, pray for them. So first of all, Paul prays for other Christians. He lifts up Timothy, and, and I, I just wrote this down. He said, mature Christians should pray for young Christians. You know, we've, as we mature, hopefully we've experienced a lot of things, both worldly and, and godly things. We've had spiritual experiences, we've had cultural experiences, we've been through trials, we've been through joys. And mature, as we mature both in age and spiritual maturity as Christians, we should be praying for young Christians. Paul here now is, is, is an elder, both physically and spiritually. And he realized how important it was to lift young Timothy up in prayer. Mature Christians have so much wisdom and knowledge and experience. And somehow we need to share that and transfer that to the next generation. And prayer is a huge part of that. I was talking to some of you earlier before the service and, and I'm... Uh, teaching or at least filling in part-time for a marriage class at our church this summer, a Sunday school class. And uh, a few weeks ago I, I taught for Gary and, and uh, it's interesting because the class is set up, of course, there's a lot of, of, you know, we start right out in Genesis and, and God created marriage, he created man and woman, the roles and the responsibilities, and, and then we jump to Ephesians and look at the men and women and all, all of those dynamics and, and, and biblical knowledge of marriage. But it's so fun. I sit in that class, there's couples that have been married 50 years and 40 years, and 30 years, and 20 years, and newly married, and there's even one couple in there that's pre-engagement. And I, I made the mistake a couple weeks ago of, of calling him out, and I said, well, it's great that you're engaged and coming to this class in wisdom, and they, she sheepishly kind of, well, we're not really engaged. <laughs> no pressure, but you're in a marriage class, just so you know that. But it's interesting to watch the discussion and, and we kind of go through the biblical principles, at least when I teach, we go through the biblical principles really quick and then I get to the discussion. And I look around the room and, and I ask questions and I look at the, at the 50 year old couple and then I look at the, you know, the newly marrieds and boy, what you get a different response when it comes to communication 
or finances or, or raising kids or all the things that we deal with in marriage. But I think it's so great how those, how those older, mature believers can share those experiences with those young couples. And some mornings, that young couple walks out of there and, oh, they're just so, they're happy. They're ready to get engaged and get going. And boy, other mornings, they're like, this is why we're not engaged yet. <laughs> this morning, I was impressed to learn we have a 50-year-old marriage that we are celebrating this week with Jim and LeVon. Isn't that great? That's congratulations to them. We're going to celebrate. It's super. My wife and I have different uh, uh, attitudes about marriage. I, I enjoy being married. I said, if she ever dies, I'm going to get married again right away. I just, I just love it. And that's why she never comes with me, because <laughs> if I ever die, she's never going to get married. She wants to live the single life. But we've been married 33 years, and Lord willing, we'll continue to be married many more. But it's just an example. Marriage is just a picture or example how we, as we age, as we develop and get spiritually mature, that's one example how we can share and transfer that knowledge and those experiences to the younger generation. And, and Paul uses the example of prayer here. He prays for Timothy, specifically for young Timothy, a leader in the church. Paul instructed him and he mentored him and encouraged him, and now he's praying for him. That must have brought such joy to Timothy, such encouragement. If only us as elder Christians, elder believers, would take the time to pray for young believers, for young Christians. What an encouragement that is. What a, what a, a way to understand their heart. Because it's not that, that I have this awesome knowledge in prayer, but as we pray intimately before the Lord, God will send those things to me. He'll show me how to pray, or, or he'll uh, instill in me a, a, a curiosity, and I'll ask other people, how can I pray for you? And as they share, you develop a, a, a more knowledgeable relationship with them. What an opportunity to, to grow, to be an encouragement, to understand them, to share their vision and their future and their, sympathize with them and encourage them through trials. Just another example how, of how Paul prayed for Timothy. Well, the next thing Paul prayed for and, uh, was really the heritage that, that Timothy had here. And, and I just wrote down, Christians should be thankful for a godly heritage. Now I know Timothy, you know, a believer, a mother that was a believer. Elsewhere in Scripture, I think it's in Acts, says Timothy's father was not a believer. But he had a strong heritage with his mother and grandmother and then people that came alongside of him to develop and help him grow in his maturity as a Christian, as a believer. So Paul was thankful for that, for not only Timothy now, but for his heritage and his growing up and his uh, the people that came alongside and instilled their knowledge and encouragement as he was developing as a young man and then as a young leader in the church. I know many of you probably in this room grew up in, in that type of environment, had Christian parents, Christian family, they supported you. you, you grew up in the church, went through the programs and the ministries, and that's great. Be thankful for that. Treat that as a blessing. Don't take that for granted. But I'm sure there's others that um, that's not the case. <laughs> you didn't have a, a uh, believing family. In fact, maybe your, your family, your parents or your siblings or, or those around you are against what you believe in Christ. Maybe it's a hostile environment. Either way, Paul says, be thankful 
for your heritage. Be thankful that now you can share God's word. That you can share the fellowship of believers. You can be encouraged by each other. You know, I was fortunate enough, my wife and I both, to grow up in, a, in Christian families. We came to know the Lord. Uh, she at an early age, me at a, at a, a little bit later in, uh, in college. But we had an opportunity and support of our families. But even as we were newly married and, and having a young family and, and in the ministry and, and in work and life, we had people that came alongside of us. I think of, of Pastor Parks and his wife May. They were, oh, I'm sure at least 25 or 30 years older than us. They treated us almost like their children and our kids like their grandchildren. They came alongside, literally, physically helped us, emotionally supported us, but most importantly, spiritually challenged us. Challenged me to be a leader and a husband and a father. And May would, would take Kathy aside and, oh, sometimes just, just put her arm around her and say, Kathy, it's, it's okay, they'll grow out of this. <laughs> when the kids were in that stage and, and later on, Kathy, now, she, she would tell my wife, Kathy, now, now you're 30 now. Now it's your time to start mentoring the younger women. And Kathy was like, oh, no, I'm not old. I'm, I'm just a young mom. I'm a... No, May said, it's, it's time to start transitioning those that are younger than you. And I thought, what an encouragement. What a, what a spiritual wisdom that they were sharing, that they were speaking into our lives. Not, not demanding, not being critical, but just mentoring us throughout a large portion of our, of our life, our marriage, and our family. We're so thankful for that, for those people that are around us. And I'm sure many of you have those type of people as well. And Paul says, be thankful. Be praying for them and, and be thankful for that heritage. Well, thirdly, Paul, in, the, in this last verse, verse 6, he said, I, for this reason I remind you to fan in the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. He's really talking now to Timothy as pastor. Timothy had these gifts. He had these gifts of preaching, of teaching, of evangelism. Uh, in, in the first letter to Timothy, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 4, Paul says, don't neglect the gift that is in you. And now he says, stir up this gift. Fan the, fan the flame, so to speak. And I just wrote down, Christians should prayerfully encourage their pastors, their leaders, their teachers. Paul wasn't praying for, for some new theology, some new religion, some new exciting ministries. Paul just came alongside Timothy and, and said, okay, you've got the Word of God, you've got the Holy Spirit, You've got the gift of teaching. Use it. I'm praying for you to use it to share with others. He wasn't hoping for some new insight or, 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 or new promotion. He just says, you have the gift of God in you. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Word. Use it. What an encouragement that is. And I think what an example for us of how we are to encourage and prayerfully come alongside our, our leaders. Now, I think I've met Pastor Vance maybe once since he's been here, and he's been here many years. Because, um, obviously, I'm here when he's not. Okay? And that's fine. But all I'm asking and saying and really responding to God's Word is that we should be praying for Pastor Vance. On a regular basis, we should be praying for the elders in this church and the leaders and those that serve in the ministries. I want to give you an example from the construction world. 
maybe we can tie this back to praying for Pastor Vance. Two years ago, I, uh, uh, there, there, there was a couple in Weston. He owned a business. We did some remodeling on his house. Two years ago, he turned 65. He retired, sold his business, moved up to Mercer, Wisconsin, of all places. All they have is mosquitoes and trees. <laughs> so he convinced me, with the help of his wife, to come up to Mercer and do some remodeling on their house there, which... That's a whole other story. That was a mistake to go to Mercer, but anyways. But the point is, we did this remodeling. A, a great Christian couple. We love them. But uh, we were sitting there one day uh, at lunchtime, and we were criticizing the drywaller because it's easy to criticize drywallers. They show up like for an hour, smear a bunch of stuff on, and then they leave, and they say, oh, we got to let it dry. <laughs> And, and Ralph looked at me, he said, boy, Bob, you know, I, I've noticed this in my life the last several years that I have been increasingly critical as I age. And I've been pessimistic and, and cynical. He said, when I was in my 30s and 40s, I was excited about life. I thought the best about people and, and about organizations, including churches and and my family and said, but now that I'm, you know, 65 and retired and boy, it's so easy to be critical. I'm impatient. Nothing is done the way I want it done. And it's not fast enough either. And he said, I really need to guard myself against that. And, and he was serious. He, this was a, a real challenge for him to, to not be cynical, to not be overly critical of those around him. And I thought of that and I said, you know, that's the way, I'm only 55 and I can already see that in my life. I don't have any patience for employees that are stupid. <laughs> And when I was 35, I did. I, you know, I, I mean, I think you, some of you probably understand where I'm coming from, and some of you are probably the stupid employee. But, <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm really, <laughs> I, I better get back to my notes. <laughs> what I'm trying to say in, in this way is that we as believers, whether we're young or old, mature or immature Christians, Paul sets the example. He says, pray for your leaders. Pray for your pastors. And, and in, not just in here. I mean, in Titus, uh, Ephesians, in Hebrews, all through the New Testament, Jesus says that, Paul says that, the disciples say that. We are to pray for our leaders, whether it's in the church, whether it's in our community or nation whether it's in our families, our husbands and wives, our parents. We are to pray for those individuals and not be overly critical. And that's tough sometimes. It's hard to do. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to, to have this lack of unity, to have differences of opinions and personalities. And sometimes we don't understand. The, the hardships or the trials or experiences that others have gone through and, and they're filtering uh, their ministry or they're filtering their marriage or their job through their experiences and, and we don't understand that. So we're critical of them. Paul sets the example here. He said, no, we just, we just need to pray for them. We need to come alongside and encourage them. It's not like we're lacking any gifts or resources. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have the fellowship of the believers. So I challenge you this morning to, to pray for your pastor. To pray for this church. To pray for the elders, the deacons, and the teachers. 
if we would add up all the time we spent criticizing and complaining and arguing and and if we would just spend that time praying imagine the difference we could make I love Paul and his letters and as I've been studying that this summer uh, the letters that and some of the other New Testament letters, it just really has challenged me to, and especially as I age a little bit, both physically and spiritually, transitions in our own life with our family and all those things, and you've, you've all experienced it in different stages of life, God's word never changes. The example of prayer, the example of encouragement, it's always there for us. And it's my hope this morning that, that we can look at that and, and, and not that we're discouraged by God's word or that somehow we, we think, oh, I failed, I fell short, I can't measure up. But no, that we would just embrace it. Embrace the word of God. Embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. Embrace prayer each and every day in our lives, both individually, and within your families, and corporately, even in this church body. It's encouraging to come here. It truly is. And, and as I talk with some of you this morning and other days, church always has challenges. Let's be realistic. We've all been around long enough. But yet there's such such a sense of fellowship and, and, and a, a family here. And prayer is such a huge part of that. So this morning I just, just wanted to share these three principles from Paul and how as, as believers we have an opportunity to pray for each other. To pray for those that are, are, are younger than us, both spiritually and physically, to just be thankful for the heritage that God has given us. And for some, that, that may be very great. For others, that may be just a, a few select people. And thirdly, that we can just pray for our leaders, for our pastors, and those that are in authority over us. Let me close in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for your word this morning. As we close today, I just... We don't understand, I don't think, sometimes the, the power of prayer or the influence of prayer. And it's not always the answer or the, the results that we see or that we expect to get. Sometimes, Lord, I think it's the, the inner change that prayer does in my own heart. Because as I pray for those around me, and as I lift my eyes to you, God, you speak to my heart as well. And Lord, I pray that each of us would listen to your voice, would listen to your word as we pray for each other. This morning I pray that we can be encouraging to those around us, but I also pray that we can grow spiritually in our relationship with you as we pray each day, as each of us individually prays. Lord, I pray for this congregation. What a tremendous group of people in this community are diligently sharing the love of Christ with each other and with the community. Father, what an example. Pray for their pastor. I pray for their leaders. Lord, that you would encourage them at all times, not just today or the next several weeks as they look at, at this vision process, but at all times. 
Just like you said to Nehemiah when he was building the wall, Lord, I can't come down. I'm doing a tremendous work. I don't want to be distracted. I pray that you would take away the distractions here in this church, in this community, that you would give them a, a clear vision to tell others about the love of Christ. And that may be done in different ways, at different times, with different people, but the message is the same. We pray these things in your name, Lord. Amen. <clears throat>